Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Darren Hart, and uh, I work for Intel's Open Source Technology Center. I work primarily on the Yocto project, um, but today I'm going to be talking about how not to write x86 platform drivers. Um, I'm a core kernel guy by, I guess, experience mostly. Um, I spent about seven years at IBM doing some real-time Linux work, scheduler work. Uh, if you saw a recent announcement about the uh, latest Zumwalt destroyer with Raytheon in the U.S. Navy, that was um, some work I was involved in for a while. It's kind of coming to fruition. It's kind of neat to see. But that was all core, core stuff. So a few texts, real time, um, locking primitives. And now with the minnow board that I was involved in, I started doing some driver work. So this is a bit of a different talk for me. So rather than talking about something that I've been doing for a decade, I'm going to talk to you about something I've been doing for six months. And some of you in here are probably more of an expert in specific things that I'll be talking about than I am. So I welcome your input. And I'm uh, very interested to, to see where this goes. So I'm going to talk about some of the mistakes that I made and uh, some of the approaches that work better and also some of the gaps that we have in the current technologies and where, and where um, we're looking to get those improved. So we've got a few folks in the audience that I know of that have been involved with Minnow as well. And just to help me get an idea for who's composing the room, uh, how many of you have written a Linux kernel driver? Oh, okay. So next door, they're talking about. No. <laughs> um, wow, that's great. Uh, OK, that actually answers my question. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just go forward then. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I, I want to talk about the term platform a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to go in specifically to using the Minnow board as an example for how not to write x86 drivers, platform drivers specifically. Um, We'll go, once we've gone through the initial phase, we'll talk about the lessons that can be learned from that process, and then we'll do it again the right way. Um, and then, as I said, there's a few next steps, a few gaps, and we'll go over those. Uh, throughout this discussion, um, if you have questions, please raise your hand. We've got 50 minutes. I've got 35 slides. Um, I did... 55 slides at the last ELCE in 45 minutes. I think we'll be OK. Um, but I'm more interested in the feedback and the discussion, so please feel free to raise your hand. Um, it's probably best that we use the mic because it's here, but if it's awkward for you to get there, I will repeat the question. So first of all, platform. This has got to be the most singly overloaded term in the Linux kernel and industry that I've come across in a decade. So out of curiosity, um, what is platform? Does anyone want to offer up definition? Tim? Something you put something else on top of. Yeah, right, <laughs> platform. All right, anyone else? It's actually a really good definition. Um, tongue in cheek, but also very good. So platform defines a lot of things. Platform can be a computer architecture. So we hear PC compatible, that's a platform. Um, it's a software framework, an OS application framework. At, at Intel, of course, Intel has to redefine everything. So Intel E's me for a platform is the combination of a CPU and the chipset. Of course, we're doing SOCs now, so it's kind of the chipset and the CPU. So it could be the SOC or anyway. Uh, Linux platform driver. So what is a platform driver? A platform driver within Linux doesn't even mean one thing. So there's two, two kinds of platform drivers in the Linux kernel. You've got pseudo bus drivers, and I'll refer to them this way, but this is the actual documented, if you go into documentation and read about platform drivers, this is what we mean. We're talking about not a real bus. This is something that gets enumerated separately from PCI, USB. But then there's also drivers slash platform slash architecture slash all the stuff that really shouldn't exist at all. Board files. Um, so that's the, another definition. So we're going to call those pseudo bus drivers and board files rather than platform drivers and platform drivers. Um, some other examples of platforms, PC BIOS, UEFI, Android, um, 
just a little bit of room for confusion in this term. So we're going to be talking about platform drivers today. And it's kind of a mix of all of these things. But primarily, the ones we don't want to write are board files. And the ones we should be writing are pseudobus drivers. But there's a lot more to it than that, which we'll get into. Um, OK, so the minnow board. Let's talk about why this got us here. Uh, there's a minnow board up here. Um, it's probably not very visible to everybody. Hopefully, people can see those little green lights, because those are going to come into play during the discussion. Um, the minnow board is kind of unique. Uh, it is, to my knowledge, one of the first completely open designs for an Atom CPU of the current, current set of generations. Um, the, the board is built by CircuitCo. Um, a lot of design work by David Anders, David Albert, um, the rest of the team there at CircuitCo with fame with the Beagle board and some of those other popular uh, community boards. Um, the, the Gerber files, the schematics, all the hardware um, design for the board is released under the Creative Commons license. All the parts are available through distributors, so you can literally download the designs, order all the parts, build your own board. Um, you can duplicate the design. The, the minnow board is a, a little different than some other designs out there, just for conceptual awareness um, for folks. So this is one of those things that can be a little confusing. But the minnow board has derivative works as one of its primary goals. And what that means is you can download all this stuff, make tweaks, rebuild the board into whatever you want it to be. Matter of fact, CircuitCo will do that happily for you. Um, so that's the minnow board. It is an Atom E6XX. It's called a Tunnel Creek design. Um, it uses the, the CPU, it's a two-chip solution currently, so it uses the, the E6XX CPU and the EG20T, which is the, the PCH, which adds some additional, um, the, the NIC, the GPIO, a few other components like that to enhance the platform. And then together, as I mentioned earlier, Tunnel Creek plus Top Cliff equals Queens Bay, which Intel calls a platform. So Queens Bay is the platform we're talking about building on top of. So some uh, properties of the minnow board. It's 32-bit UEFI. It's one of the first Queens Bay platforms to make use of all of its GPIO. Um, so this is one of the things that actually was quite a bit of work for us to get this thing going. So despite the fact that Queens Bay had all these GPIOs in the past, hadn't actually really been used on, on a platform in this way. Um, the UART is a little bit special on every release of this platform. And the, the Ethernet itself, um, th this was interesting. Um, we ended up using a PHY that was not quite as common in some of the original Intel designs, which threw us for a few loops that we had to fix up in the software. So that's, these are some of the problems that we're going to address. But more fundamentally to the minnow board, and this is, this is where it deviates from a lot of Intel architecture designs that are out there today. Most Intel designs that, that I'm aware of tend to have a, a static baseboard, a static motherboard, a system board. It doesn't change. And then you expand that to do what you want with PCI, PCIe, USB, SATA, all of these self-discoverable connections. The minnow board has an expansion slot. Um, actually, I've got it covered up because there is a secondary board on the top here. And it exports PCIe, it exports SATA, it exports USB all self-discoverable, but it also exports I2C, SPY, CAN, non-discoverable buses that need to be described in some way. But because they're here, when people build out this board to do things with it, the baseboard is dynamic. So it changes. One person's minnow board is going to be different from someone else's minnow board. The way the GPIOs are mapped is going to be different from, implement from instance to instance of how the board is used. And that is sort of a fund fundamental shift for IA designs. All right, so let's talk about how do we deal with this for the minnow board on the GPIO. So there's three sources of GPIO on the minnow board. The CPU itself has got a core well, which means it's powered when the CPU is powered. And it's got a suspend well, which means these lines are available when the device is in resume. It's also got another 12 GPIO lines on the platform controller hub, on the PCH or the chipset. Both of these are PCI enumerated, and the kernel already knows about them. We fixed, had to fix like three bugs or something in there. Um, again, because those GPIOs had not really been 
heavily used in the past. There, there were problems like it assumed only eight bits, but as you can see, we've got you know, 13 and 12, so you couldn't actually access the upper bits of the thing. So some simple things like that, those are easy to fix. So send them upstream, they get pulled into the stable trees, done. Um, but how are we using these? So if you look on the front of the minnow here, there are, um, I don't know how many people can see this very well. There are four buttons here, and then there's a series of LEDs, and two of those are just tied to GPIO. So we've got four <laughs> user buttons tied to GPIO and two LEDs tied to GPIO. This is not exactly interesting driver stuff, but it is representative. And so they're, they're, they serve, good exam serve as good examples to, to talk about. Something you can't really see here is the Phi has a physical reset line. And one of the GPIOs is used to tag that reset line to be able to wake the Phi up. And we'll talk about that when we get into the, to the Ethernet side of things. And then, of course, we took another eight GPIO lines and we sent them out the expansion header so that people can build GPIO lures. The daughter cards for the top of the minnow are called, are called lures. Um, so how do, we, how, do, how do we make use of these? Well, there's, there's, um, uh, there, there's something called a board file, which I, I mentioned earlier. It's what you'll find in the kernel sources, driver, platform, architecture, splat. Um, these are, are non-enumerating drivers. So you just load them with mod probe, right? And, and, and they load up and they do their thing. Hopefully they do some sort of validation as to I should really be running here, but they don't have to, which makes them a little bit dangerous. It makes some assumptions about hardware. They're, it's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into this a, a little bit more. Um, but there's some great examples in the kernel on how to do this. And uh, they're really easy to write. So you basically open up a driver, you do your boilerplate driver stuff, you've got your init, your exit, and then during init, you reserve a few GPIO lines, you create the arrays that you need to do for the platform drivers, and by now I'm talking about the good kind. So, um, we're, we're, so for example, uh, GPI, uh, GPIO keys or LEDs GPIO, those are examples of platform drivers. And what you do is you, you take a platform structure, platform data structure, and you fill it in with um, the, the things that are relevant to that. So for the LEDs, for example, you need to give it a GPIO line, you need to give it a trigger, um, and then you just create that platform driver and you now have a LEDs GPIO driver. You do the same thing for GPIO keys, uh, export a few GPIOs to the SysFS and you're done, board works, it's great. How many people have written a board file? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so they look something like this, right? They're really easy to do. Um, up here, I, I, I tried to get it to fit on here. In the back, can people read this font? Nice. Um, so in green is where I tried to highlight the interesting bits. So at the very top is the list of files and to do everything that we've talked about, to do the GPIO, to do the LEDs, to do the buttons, to do the phi reset, board detection type, set out the hardware ID, it's 462 lines, all of which have a header about like this at the top of four different files, and it's, that's it. Um, so for, a, for me to do this for my single board, this was easy. Um, so a request, for example, you can request an array of GPIOs. Um, you can request a single GPIO. I, I should have highlighted there. It says uh, minnow phi reset, right? Um, and then I, I registered the platform device that I had populated for minnow GPIO LEDs and that has a compatibility to work with G, the LEDs GPIO driver, and it loads up and it's done. I, I, I even have my own little functions for the minnow board. So minnow detect, for example. It'll go and check the SMBIO string, DMI board name, make sure it's minnow board, and if it is, it returns true, and if it's not, it returns false. So now I can just include my header file that has the minnow detect declaration in any driver that I want. If I have to do special stuff, I just check. Am I a minnow board? Yes, do this stuff, right? Great. No. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I knew this was wrong when I did it, but we didn't have really a solid way to handle this the right way, so I went ahead and sent it out anyway and got some really great feedback. So Linus W. Um, gave us some really good feedback, Greg KH, of course. Um, anybody that discussed this with me on LKML in the room? No? Okay. I can say whatever I want. Um, <laughs> No, honestly, really great responses. But mostly, let's not add anything to platform drivers x86 splat. 
Okay, nothing goes there. No more board files, please. Okay, so why, why is this bad? Um, as I said, they're not self-enumerating. So they make assumptions. And even though I had a minnow detect in there where I checked the DMI string, not everybody necessarily would have. And so if you do that, let's say you just grab a GPIO line, set it to an input, or no, yeah, you set it to an input. No, how does that work? Anyway, you can fry your board. I can't think up here. Um, you, you could really do some damage to, to your hardware if you make assumptions about the way it's supposed to work. You start randomly writing to registers because those are yours, right? Unless it runs on another system and then they're not. Um, so it's really bad design practice. Um, it doesn't leverage code that already exists. Worse yet, for the kernel maintainers that you're talking to, it adds more files that they have to maintain. So that doesn't tend to make them happy. It also impacted every one of those drivers there along the bottom. So the PCHUART, the PCHGBE, the, the LPCSCH, the GPIOSCH, the GPIOPCH, all of these drivers now had to be minnow board aware. That's great for me, but it doesn't scale. So how many of you have supported a board? Okay, so now we have 50, if this is my board, do this, if this is your board, do that. So this doesn't scale well, and it leads to evil vendor trees. Oh, so that's not how you do it, and we'll get back to what does work. Um, but in the meantime, let's talk about some others that, that highlight things like enumeration, identification, device description. So the minnow board UART, this is actually something I had to solve for a previous device called the Fish River Island 2. But because of the way this um, UART works, is the firmware gets to decide the clock at which the UART is driven. So it's PCI enumerated. I know what the device is. I know the vendor. I know the product. I still have no clue what the clock runs at. So how do I check? There's a few options. Um, there's already existing precedent in the driver to check for the SM BIOS string. So that's what the previous systems did before I added these systems. So we, we continued with that. I actually ended up rewriting it to use the DMI match infrastructure when Greg said, hey, there's a DMI match infrastructure. Why are you doing all this string compares yourself? Um, so we rewrote it and made it and made it do that. But it's pretty simple. Um, you can see what the old one did, checks the product name. If it's Fish River Island 2, then you set it to the 48 megahertz clock. If it's the minnow board, then you set it to the minnow board UART clock, which happened to be 50 megahertz, just enough to, you know, give you garbage on the screen. Um, I wouldn't recommend using SM BIOS strings on new designs. It's not bad. It works. It's not really necessary, and there's better ways to go about it, and we'll, and we'll talk about those. Now, the Ethernet is fun, and this is a really good example of some of the complexity about driver writing, which is not immediately obvious to a core kernel guy, and, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a little bit in more detail. But what's sum, summarized up here, these are the things that we had to do special for our special phi. Um, basically, there's two, two things that are special about the phi. First of all, it's narcoleptic. So it goes to sleep every opportunity it gets. You pull the cable out, it goes to sleep. I'm sure that's great for some reasons, but <laughs> it was really frustrating for us. The other thing is a lot of FIs have um, uh, strapping involved, which will allow you to either um, use a two nanosecond clock delay in the traces on the board, meaning you route the traces just so, so that it takes some time for that signal to propagate, or you can force it to use a software delay inside the phi. This is, this is technical stuff about the way Max and phi's work. Um, is everybody comfortable with the difference between a Mac and a phi? Because that's important today. Okay, so it's worth covering. So, so the Mac talks all of the, okay, somebody can describe this better than me, but I'm gonna sum, sum, summarize it like this. The Mac does all of the sort of digital aspect of the networking. This is where the ethernet frames go. This is how we order the bits. This is, this is what it looks like. And then the phi takes that and pushes it into the real world. Is that, okay? So you can use various phi's with a Mac. They don't necessarily have to be matched up. 
but that doesn't mean that the drivers are necessarily aware that you can match them all up differently. A phi hangs off the Mac and it can communicate over something called RGMII and you can talk to it and say, hey, which phi are you? And it says, oh, I'm this ID. And you say, oh, okay, I know how to talk to you. Um, these are the things we need to do in order to talk to this phi. First of all, we gotta <laughs> flip the, the phi reset line that we talked about. So that's what the top four lines are doing, right? We just hold it low, pull it back high, wait, okay, it's awake, let's move forward. The next block is to configure that two nanosecond delay. This is really easy. You set the register, you read the register, you set the flag, you write the register, done. Then you do it again for dis disable hibernate because I don't know when this thing's going to sleep again and basically I just want to keep the thing awake so that I can use the, the network right now. This is not the ideal way to do this, but um, again, set the register, read the register, set the flag, write the register, basic stuff. The first patch we had to do this took these three blobs and then they stuck them in init, probe, and phi setup. Done, it works. For my board, doesn't work for anyone else's board. How do I detect that I'm running on a minnow board? How do I make this acceptable to David Miller, right? Well, you just read over RGMII, right? You go to the phi and you say, which phi are you? And it gives you its ID and then you can talk to it. But it's asleep, so it's not talking to you. So you don't know who it is because it's not responding over RGMII. Okay, so we need another way to identify the platform. We could use SMBIOS and that would have worked. Um, we could use device tree, but pulling in device tree onto an x86 board just for the phi is kind of, doesn't really seem right. Could it, could it use ACPI, except this is a PCI enumerated device and it's already got all the infrastructure in place for PCI. I've learned later, actually this, this could have worked. We could have used ACPI to do this. Um, but something I didn't know about was a PCI subsystem ID. So in addition to a PCI vendor ID and a PCI <laughs> product ID, there's also such thing as a PCI sub-vendor ID, which also, subsystem ID, which also gives you a vendor and a product for a subsystem, which means I took this chip from Intel, I put it on my board, and now I'm treating it a little bit differently, so here's my ID. This is really cool. It took me a couple of months to find, track down all the people that I needed to track down to actually get an ID assigned. So if you're gonna start working with an Intel device and you want to do some derivative work with a PCI device, Get yourself signed up for the PCI SIG. It's cheap. You can get your IDs, manage your own IDs, save yourself some time. <laughs> um, th this is really great. Now, now when the minnow board uh, device probes, it sees the circuit co subsystem IDs and it knows which device it is. Um, so now what do we do? We, could, we know we have three things that we need to do. We need to wake it up, we need to set the two nanosecond clock delay, and we need to disable hibernation. Um, some of those can actually be abstracted. So rather than saying, if I'm a minnow board, do this, if I'm a minnow board, do that, if I'm a minnow board, do this in several places, what if we were to have a platform init structure? So now there's a little blob for the minnow board or any other device that wants to use this that is a little bit special and it can just set up, do I need two nanosecond clock delay? Because this is not a minnow board specific thing. That's a standard thing. And someone could use this phi and not need it. Um, or they could use a different phi and not need it. Um, so does it need two nanosecond? Does it need to have hibernation disabled? And do you need to do anything special to initialize it in the first place? So now we can make one of those structures for every device that uses this. So now we, we've been able to do something a little more generic. And so this is how we'd go about that. So at the top is the priv data for the minnow board specifically. It, so clock data true, hibernate true, platform init function callback, right? So it calls that during init. Then we set up the PCI device table. And so in green there, you can see the delta. Right below it is the old one, right? That was for the old Intel. And you'll notice the vendor and device are the same for two blocks. It just adds the sub vendor and the sub device. So now we switch on that and we identify it. And then we just create, I didn't flush them out for you because you already saw the code earlier in the bigger blob, right? So there's the three functions down below. The platform init, which does the GPIO um, flip, um, the clock delay, and the hibernate. So there's our three functions, and that basically works. Okay, but what about the Mac? So the Mac has typic Macs typically have an EEPROM, and on the EEPROM you can store various things, including your Ethernet address. 
EEPROMs cost money, and a lot of hobbyist boards will just use one of the locally allocated max, right, for IEEE, whatever that's called. IEEE locally, locally allocated, there's a little block that you can use for this. The problem with that is if you have a lot of these boards on a network, obviously they will collide because they're eventually, they'll be conflicting on max. And the, the, the people we were working with within Intel thought, you know, we really should not be doing this for, for an Intel board. It, it's not gonna be what people are expecting of an IA board. So let, let's go ahead and get some Macs and do this right. But we still didn't wanna put an EEPROM on the device. Keeping the cost down was really important and we just couldn't, we just couldn't justify the EEPROM. So we went through some various ways of doing this. So, so how do you store a Mac? Um, we actually got to the point where we said, well, we've got the firmware. We, we could just stick it in a certain region of the spy flash, and then you could go read it. But while that's fairly doable from firmware, it's actually a lot more complicated from the OS than you might like to think. Well, okay, if the firmware knows it, we're running a 32-bit EFI firmware. EFI firmware variables are actually really well suited to storing hex strings. Um, and we actually had a patch that did this. We stored it in an EFI variable. If you were on the minnow board, you loaded that EFI variable. There was your Mac uh, Ethernet address. You loaded it. We would have definitely received some criticisms of it. I wasn't looking forward to sending that patch to David Miller. Um, but what uh, eventually it, uh, Peter Anvin ha had recommended this. Typically, the way the driver works is it boots up, it reads the EE prom, it finds the Mac, it sticks it in the PCI configuration register. Well, there is no EE prom, so that read fails. But that's okay because now what we can do is before we booted in the firmware, we read it from the location on the spy flash, which was easy to do in firmware, and then we just cram it in the PCI register from firmware. So when we boot up, it goes ahead, it looks at the EE prom, it doesn't find it, it goes back, it's got a valid one in the PCI register already, and we didn't have to make any driver changes. So that was great. If you don't have to do anything at all to your driver to support your device, that's, <laughs> that's the best way to go. Okay, so we've had a few successful changes, the UART, the Mac, the Phi, those all worked. The GPIO was a disaster. Um, so let's talk about what we learned a little bit. Okay, so does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay. So, sorry. Yeah. How do you mean? Literally, like if I want to run my own firmware on this board, so they might have a total loss and uh, it's not going to work. So there is a tool on that we ship with the firmware that allows you to set the MAC address again. But if you did want to change your firmware, you, you, you certainly can, but you would be responsible to populating the PCI register with the MAC address, however you, you choose to store it, right? That would, that, that would just be one of the requirements of your firmware. Um, so platform has become a pretty important thing for IA boards. Um, as something that is a block upon which you build other things, the less you change it, the more reusable it is. Um, a good platform reduces time to market for people building derivative works of, of, your, of your product. And x86 is actually a really strong platform. And so as driver riders, it is our responsibility to uphold, defend, and continue that platform. So we do not fragment it. We do not create evil vendor trees. Right, we, we do, the, this, is, this is how we should be doing this. Um, we preserve the platform. So I mentioned something about complexity. So as a core kernel guy, I spent most of my um, kernel development looking at really small sections of code and how they related to other really small sections of code. Lots of them at a time, hundreds of threads. How, how, do, how do these parallel uh, algorithms run together? Does the locking work? Do you have my memory barriers in the right place? This was brain bending complexity for me. It was a lot of work and it was, it's a lot of fun. When you start, if you start looking at drivers, you take any one driver, you take any one function and you look at it and it's dead simple, right? Read the register, set the bit, write the register. Really simple stuff until you back out a little bit and you start to realize how all these devices interact with each other, how many classes of devices there are, how they enumerate, 
Um, it actually gets really complex as you back out and look at it from far away. So the complexity of core kernel development versus driver development is inverted. Uh, Greg Kerr Hartman once said that a great drive, I don't know if he said software developer or if he said driver developer, but I think we can say it's true for a driver developer. One of the best thing, one of the things you want to look for in a great driver developer is organizational skills. And I think that is especially true with drivers as I look at the complexity of the, all of the subsystems put together. And Greg has done a phenomenal job organizing drivers and, and everyone that works with him, and it sounds like a lot of you. Um, so I was really impressed, actually. I think it's um, pretty clean code. So on the front end, this was, this was something that we learned working with CircuitCo. So this is the Intel's Yocto Project folks, the UEFI team that worked with us with CircuitCo. Together as we built this board, one of the things we learned is that typically the way IA products are designed, I, but when I say IA, I mean Intel architecture. Typically the way IA products are designed is there is a single reference design and then lots of companies take that single reference design and they make a product from it, but they don't deviate very much from it. Meaning they don't go out and use the cheapest phi they could find that suit, suited their needs or the one that they could get quickly or the one that they could get in the quantities that they needed. They used the one that we used in the reference design. So if you have the opportunity to influence the design of the board before you start writing your drivers, consider what the drivers support already. And if you can select a part that already works with the drivers, that's a great way to go. In the case of the Ethernet on the Minnow board, one of the problems that we had was that particular driver probably could have been written better in the first place. It probably could have used Phylib, which it doesn't use, it should use, and we have somebody volunteering to actually migrate the changes that we made to make the driver use Phylib and incorporate the changes that we made. He's doing that as a side project uh, just to contribute. I think that's great. Um, yeah, so if you have an opportunity to influence the design, spend the time to research how the drivers that you plan on using already work and what they support. Um, do they need special layout and configuration? For example, should you go ahead and run that long trace to get your two nanosecond clock delay between the TX and the, and the output on the phi? Is it? <laughs> okay, so maybe you can't do that, right? <laughs> I didn't realize it was quite so long. Um, but th those are some things to consider. So identification and description. As we, as we started looking through all those drivers, there were two things that really came, th that this really boils down to, is how do you identify your device and how do you describe your device? You can identify it in a number of ways that we talked about. PCI provides vendor, product, subsystem IDs. You've got firmware description, either via ACPI, the device tree. Um, you can do SM BIOS. Uh, there's probably some others, um, but the, 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 those are the basics. Um, and then how do you describe it? So PCI, of course, has got register blocks for every single device, and it's all there in hardware for you. Um, and then there's big tables about what all of that means. Um, it can be hard-coded by ID, which is what we saw with the board files, where, well, not necessarily the board, well, anyway, you can hard-code it in the driver. But the problem with hard-coding it in the driver is it's not particularly flexible. So one of the things that I mentioned on the minnow board, right, you've got these LEDs and these buttons. So the LEDs do things like run a heartbeat, show you MMC activity, stuff like that. Well, what if I didn't want to show the MMC activity of MMC0, I wanted to show it of MMC1 that is the device that I added to my lure? Now I have to change the kernel driver to do that? Or at least by default. Yeah, I can do it through SysFS, but it's gonna boot up showing the wrong thing and maybe I care about what it's showing during boot. Um, well, <laughs> right, so you can describe it in firmware. And on an x86 system, they typically have ACPI already. So you could try and take ACPI and you can marry it with device tree and you could try to cram them together onto the system and get them to work, and you could do it. But should you do it? I don't want to spend, we could spend the next hour talking about device tree. We could spend the next three hours talking about ACPI and device tree. We could bike shed on this all day. Um, what I'm gonna say, as my stance from the experience that I had and the people that I spoke with, this is what I believe to be the right thing. 
ACPI and device tree try to accomplish some of the th same things. And it's not going to be easy or clean to take those two things and try and cram them both in the driver's seat. So really what I think we need is a way to be able to say, hey, firmware, whoever you are, I need this device property. Give it to me. Now, if you're ACPI, give it to me this way. If you're device tree, give it to me that way. And I'm seeing some skepticism. Let me show you what we've got working now. Um, so the biggest lesson I think about this is when, when we're focusing on a board and we're working to get it out, it's really easy to think about our delivery dates and all of that. It's not just about you. When you're writing a device driver, you're contributing it to the Linux kernel. It's going to have to be maintained by people. It's going to be used by your customers to do other things. Do you want to lock your customers into a specific kernel version? Um, there's a lot of really good reasons to not write board files. Um, do you want to make these things as flexible as possible, as easily maintained as possible? And um, yeah, actually, I think that, that, that sums it up. Um, and of course, Linus decided yesterday or two days ago to go ahead and reemphasize that for us. So I had to, I got to add that slide this morning. So thank you, Linus. <laughs> All right. So let's take another approach to looking at the GPIO drivers for the minimum board. How, how could we do this in a way that might be acceptable upstream? By the way, all the other drivers for the minimum board are now in 3.12. Um, the GPIO drivers are not. So from the lessons learned, we want no device, we want no board files. Matter of fact, if we could add no new files at all that reduces long-term maintenance, reuses the most code, that would be ideal. Um, and then let's continue to support the platform. On IA, we have UEFI, on, I'm sorry, on the middle board, we've got 32-bit UEFI, and on IA systems, we tend to have ACPI. Um, so we're going to take a look at how can we do what we want to do with ACPI. Is device tree an option? Sure. It, it could be made to work. Um, so identification and description. What does ACPI 5 do today? Um, you can create HIDs readily, hardware, hardware IDs, right? So there, it's, it's um, enumerable. Um, it's actually very easy to take ACPI bindings and add them to um, a PCI device so you can get added configuration that way. Um, ACPI already knows about, as, as of 5.0, can already describe GPIO. It can describe pins, it can describe interrupts, um, it can describe the address and ranges and things like that. What it does not do is provide a standard mechanism to be able to give you arbitrary device properties. And I said standard mechanism. Can it be done? Yes. Apple does it now. Um, they have device-specific methods, for example, that they query in a certain way. It sends them back a buffer for how big the result is. And then they send another query. And then they get the big buffer back from ACPI. And then they do whatever they want with that. It works, but it works in a very limited environment. And it's not generally safe, um, is the summary. Again, that's probably something we could talk about a lot. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go over how we went ahead and made this work on the MINA board with ACPI in a way that we're hopeful will be acceptable into the standard. And acknowledgments to everybody here um, that had a lot to do with making this work, wrote some of the code into ACPI, um, did a lot of the brainstorming to help make this uh, a reality. So um, I want to make sure that everyone sees that the following slides are not all my work. It's um, taken in with a lot of input from these folks. Okay, <clears throat> so a DSDT, um, I forget the D, I think it's device, but uh, system descriptor table. This is the big blob that you can dump out of any system running ACPI with the, right, with, with the IA ACPI tools. You can just dump them out. Um, so with ACPI 5 as it stands today, we can do something like this. Um, ACPI is a heavily scoped uh, sorry, ASL is a heavily scoped language. And what you're seeing here in green, SB, PCI0, LPC. So this takes us down on the, P on the system bus, the, on the PCI0, on PCI there's a low pin count device. It already knows about this. So we're just going to scope it to there. And now if we go below that, we're going to create our own HID. For the purposes of the demo, we're calling it Minnow 3 here. Um, and then we're going to set up 
a couple of GPIO resources. So in this case, I want to take suspend line five and suspend line six, and I want because I want to use these as the two GPIO lines that are driving my LEDs. So I've set up 10 and 11 here. But once I've sent that up to the kernel, I wouldn't necessarily be able to do anything with it because I don't know what the trigger is. I don't know, you know, if, if these were GPIO buttons, I don't know what the key codes are, right? These are all things that you can do today with device tree really easily. Couple of lines, you send it in, right? And the, the platform drivers know how to use it. Well, ACPI has something called a package. And a package is basically a typeless array. And you can use any kind of type that you want, strings, integers, additional packages. What it seems like we really want for device description is a dictionary. You basically want a label and some data. And it should be in, received in some standard way that you, you, you can readily parse it, you can readily validate it, that it's what you want. So we could just do a dictionary that would be just a, you know, string value, string value, string value, and that you could make the code parse that and use it as a dictionary. But if you wanted to add a little bit more structure to it, if you wanted to make it a little more formal, you could create a package of packages, which has each package is a tuple. All right, and you've got a, you've got a label and a value. Um, so here's an example of that in the middle there. So you've got string, hello world, number gives you 10, list has a package of one and two, integer one and two. Um, so if you wanted to throw that into ACPI, you could create a method called, say, properties. And you could create a package and return that package that had a set of key value pairs. But it really needs to be standardized. So we should use a reserved word in ACPI. So we could come up with something, reserved, reserved words in ACPI all start with an underscore. So um, you could have, for example, an underscore PRP method, which would be the properties method. Um, and it would look something like this. So you'd have the device, again, we're in the same scope. System bus, PCIe zero, LPC, same device. This is LEDs, right? So up here, in, in here, you would also have the GPIO description that we had on the previous slide just adding to that the PRP method. And then here's a dictionary that returns label. Um, so for instance, with, um, with GPIO lines, it's generally helpful to be able to identify them. And in sys kernel GPIO, no, sys kernel debug GPIO, um, it'll list the name for each GPIO line. So it'd be great if we can label those, right? Um, so you can do that here on that first line. You just say label, and I want it to be minnow led zero, minnow led one. And then for the triggers, I want to use heartbeat and MMC0. And then there's some other arbitrary, um, excuse me, uh, arbitrary properties that you need for this particular platform driver. So you add that to your DSDT, you compile the DSDT, um, and then the only thing you need to do is add your ACPI HIDs to the ACPI platform.c, and that's what's being done there. You add minnow 2 and minnow 3. This is, yeah. Uh, where does this DSTC enter the minnow board? Is it uh, in production or? Uh, uh, with this one or? Um, the previous slide. Uh, I don't know too much about the x86. So how, how does that? OK, I, I think I, OK. So the question is, how, how do these changes get onto the board so that you can use them? I think you're asking, what is the equivalent to the lib firmware flattened device tree thing, yeah. right? Okay. Um, that is not a gap that I thought, I didn't think it was a gap, and then I found out it kind of is a gap. And it's not a big gap, though. Um, the way it works currently is you can, you can take out the device, you can take out the DSDT, then you modify it, and then you replace it. And you can do that the, one of two ways. You either compile it into the kernel, or you can set it up in an initial RAM disk. The way it should work is you should be able to use what's called an SSDT, which is a secondary system descriptor, descriptor table. And as long as that augments information, this is in the ACPI spec, as long as that augments information, not replaces it, you can layer them, right? The, 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 the fact is, because we haven't been doing this, the tooling in the kernel today doesn't allow you to augment. It only allows you to completely replace the DSDT. 
Um, that's a gap that needs to get fixed. Five minutes, okay. Um, so, in order to use this information, we have to, set the, we have to set the hardware IDs so that the device drivers can recognize them. And then we have to set up a ACPI parsing function. So if you were to take a look at the LEDs GPIO or the GPIO keys, you will see an OF parsing function, which reads device tree. So we add one that reads ACPI. Um, and basically you look and see which one you have, and then you, pop you basically just populate the platform structure that's empty, and then you create your device with that. And that's, it, it, it parallels exactly how the open firmware model works and the ACPI model works. Okay, um, so once you've done that in the ACPI properties driver, then you augment your ledge GPIO driver or your, and I just meant, this is actually what I just mentioned. Um, so you can see here, um, I'm gonna walk away for a second. But if you look up there, Linux default trigger. Um, so, so that was one of the, the strings that we had set in the ACPI properties function. So it works just like it does in device tree. You say, hey, I want that function and I need you know, th these many of them, and it reads an array, and it sets it into the array, and then you walk through the platform device, which has an array of, of LEDs, and it fills them in. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and with that, so there's the minimum board. It's running 3.12.0 RC5 right now, and if we were to watch uh, debug GPIO, um, you can see that we pulled in all the labels. So you've got them, we did it for the buttons, we did it for the LEDs, we did it for the Phi reset. So they're all there, um, and as I, I'm gonna push the wrong button, I know it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Coon's done it. <laughs> uh, so you can see, right, those have been mapped into the driver. They're working, and if you look closely here, um, you'll see an LED that's blinking. And so that's basically the heartbeat. So we've set up the trigger for the heartbeat. Um, in the future, I'm gonna cut this a little bit short. I, I'm not cutting a lot off, but um, let's go to next steps there. Um, there's a few things left here to be done. The PRP method needs to be formalized. Um, we really need one more layer of abstraction. Rather than having every device driver have to say, this is how you do open firmware parsing, this is how you do ACPI parsing, to just do device property collection. I, wanted, I need this property for this device. If I'm open firmware, I'll go over there. If I'm ACPI, I'll go over there. I'll collect the information, I'll make it work. Um, so that, that's been discussed on LKML. Um, there should be some more talk about it today at Kernel Summit, and there was another discussion at Linux Plumbers um, in New Orleans about a month ago. And this seems to be generally accepted as a good way to go. So there's more detail that needs to be discussed, but seems to be going in the right direction. One thing you may have noticed, adding the MINO002, MINO003 IDs, that's kind of a pain, especially for generic drivers. So what we'd really like to have is a set of standardized, reusable keys and or IDs. And then you don't have to add them at all. You just, just like in device tree, you would say this is compatible with this driver. In ACPI, you would say this is HID, you know, Linux 0560, and that's the LEDs. Yes. You, you could add as many as you wanted, yeah. For for, for the single device? Yeah. I suppose you could. I, I don't... In device tree, we can say it's a general purpose GPIO, but then we can say it's a special freescale one, so that you can have a generic driver, and then the driver can enhance or... Right. I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that, um, because you would just add two... Yeah, to the ACPI match table, you would add the two IDs, and then as you parse those IDs, you would get different information and configure the device. I don't see why that wouldn't work. It's not something I've explored fully, though. Um, as was asked about firmware, one of the other gaps here is we need to continue to make the firmware more open because this will make it more and more useful to people to be able to rebuild, reconfigure, change those DSTTs in the firmware and go. Um, 
So um, I am out of time. I had hoped we'd have a few more minutes for questions towards the end, but I do have time scheduled at a chalk talk at the Intel booth, and basically that talk is answer questions and go into more depth. So if you have questions, you want to talk about it in more detail, come see us at the booth. And I hope this was helpful. Thank you.